the deep state, the administrative state more broadly, is the rotten fruit of our individual members of Congress, our two senators from our, each of our respective states, not taking the, the courage, not having the courage to pass bills or kill bills on behalf of self-governance. And so this is precisely why Heritage, along with 54 other conservative organizations, 400 policy scholars, has been working so intently on Project 2025, the aim of which is to take the, the biggest dagger ever and place it firmly in the center of the heart of the deep state. As we sit here, do you think that there's much of a chance that any of the political allies of President Biden will have to deal with the 87,000 new IRS agents? Of course not. But those of us at Heritage, people in right of center media outlets, just common sense media outlets that are not mouthpieces for the regime, they have to be worried. That's unconscionable in, in modern America. And so Heritage, all of us at Heritage wake up every day fighting that, looking forward to the day when we can finally fix it. Describe to me the regime that you just mentioned. What is that? There are two elements of it. The figureheads of the regime are Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But the regime is a, a long-running project of, of the political left. It, it really started or, or was, was amplified in the late 60s and early 70s in the, the anti-Vietnam War protest of the academic left. The, the short version of the story is that those people have been in political power for the last couple of decades. They're members of the House, members of the Senate, executives in the executive branch of the United States. And the reason I insist on calling it a regime is because these people don't believe in small r Republican principles. They don't believe that there is a common good to which they owe a moral obligation as many Republicans and Democrat leaders leading up to this point have. And so Heritage insists on calling it a regime because they're not focused on self-governance. They, they hate what the everyday American stands for. You know, we could sit here and, and go through the litany of pejorative ways that Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden and Barack Obama have described people like me, gun owners, someone who goes to church. I mean, something as radical as that, they hate us. And we need to be careful not to hate them. Those of us, given our particular faith traditions, shouldn't be filled with hatred, but we do need to be filled with a zeal in the public square to confront them, to defeat them, and to make sure that they're never in power again. I keep thinking about what's been dubbed by some the disinformation industrial complex. I love that. Which has, you know, grown up, let's say over the last seven, seven odd years, to the point where there's people, you know, studying in universities to become experts at this thing, right? And there's this effort in our society, or there's this moment in our society where some of us, and I'll say us broadly, right, believe that speech should be curtailed, believe that certain beliefs should be amplified, you know, massively. And those are the, and these are, this is, you know, go, going back to what I was talking about, this cognitive liberty spectrum, right? That, that there's certain correct beliefs that are acceptable and there's other ones which need to be hidden and unavailable to, to, to people to even know. And there's this, there's a whole mechanism of manufacturing perceived consensus in society. It's a very powerful, I call it the megaphone, it's a very powerful mechanism and there's multiple organizations involved and the media are just part of it. And there's some portion of our population also that's incredibly susceptible to it and not, not bad people, not morally questionable people in, in, in some cases, in many cases, just easy to influence. First of all, do you agree, if you, if you do, you know, how can we have some kind of unity in a society where this megaphone can always create, you know, incredible strife through whatever it decides to push through itself? I not only agree, Jan, I, if I have your permission, I'm going to use your phrase, manufacturing perceived consensus, because it, that is so true. And, and, and that largely happens by our legacy media outlets, which are primarily based in New York City and in Washington. And, and the solution to that is for people to spend more time with regular folks 
outside those cities, but also inside those cities. There are a lot of regular folks in Washington and New York City, right? That is to say, watch Epoch Times, read the Epoch Times paper, but be very selective after that with the news, the national news that we're consuming, and take whatever time you're saving by no longer consuming that news and spend it with everyday people. It's, it's why, as, as my staff at Heritage know, when I'm outside DC, which is most of the time, whether I'm, I'm in home in, in Virginia or traveling on behalf of Heritage, I always stop in a McDonald's. I always stop in a convenience store. I don't care the neighborhood. I don't care if I kind of look out of place as a middle-aged bald white guy. Those are my fellow Americans. And you can be engaged in a conversation. You know, my wife would say that she learns more about politics by being in the produce aisle at the local grocery store than she does reading most outlets. She's a huge fan, of course, of Epoch Times. But the, the point is, we should not give those people who want to use a megaphone to, to get us to, to stop thinking what we do about self-governance, the power that they have. And the only way to do that is to be a lot more intentional with the news that we consume and to be really focused on spending greater time in community. But then that still begs the question, how then do you establish unity? Well, for more than 200 years, that's how Americans consume their news and there was a certain unity about that. Why? Because it, it's just scientifically, biologically obvious that humans have many things in common. And one of the things that we're, we're hardwired to do, especially in American history, is to love our country. And the reason that we want to do that is because we love our neighbor. Isn't it interesting that these people who are manufacturing perceived consensus emphasize what divides us, what causes us to be suspicious of our neighbor? That's not what it means to be an American. So stop consuming news that says that.